Well, 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 what it is, what it is, what it, what it is. Um, by special request by one of our viewers, they requested that I do a review of myself, kind of. Um, oh, boy. Uh, 12, 15 years ago, um, myself, my now ex-wife and her daughter, um, created a television show for Versus Network called Travelers in Paradise. And it was a story, it was a dream that I still have to this day, although the players have changed. Um, it was a dream for me to go sailing around the world with my wife and show her the world, which is what I intended on doing. Um, sadly, we've divorced since then, so that's never going to happen. But in the meantime, we produced a series of television shows. Um, I believe there's four episodes that can be found on on YouTube if you search Travelers in Paradise. Um, I'll put a link to this original one that we're going to watch today in, in the description down below, so you'll be able to click on it and see that as well, and then from there jump around to the other episodes. There's four, I think, that you can find. Uh, but th in this case, it's it's me and uh, what was at the time my wife and her daughter, our daughter at the time, um, and we were making a TV show about us basically sailing around the world. We, the, a family of three on a catamaran sailing around the world, scuba diving, fishing, raising awareness of uh, environmental issues, um, trying to get people to stop polluting the ocean to some degree. Uh, educating people about history in different places and telling stories about what went on in those areas and, you know, ferreting out that kind of interesting information about a place. Uh, that was kind of the, the intent and still is to this very day, um, except I'm going to add in some more scuba diving and some citizen science projects and that kind of stuff that we can get involved in. But be that as it may, that is my goal right now is to get back out there on a more permanent basis. This was a mistake that we made when we did this television show. We, um, we tried to go too big. We were, we were trying to start up a television show at a time where everybody was switching over to YouTube. This is when YouTube was just starting, fledgling, uh, unheard of actually at that time. So um, our mistake was what we should have done is we should have made a YouTube channel and not tried to produce this you know, television show we could have started out with a smaller boat like the one we owned in Seattle at the time, uh, a little Cal 30 that we owned. We could have started just with that, making some content and, and grew it from there, but we didn't. My mistake cost me a lot. But in any event, on a brighter note, uh, somebody asked me to do a review of our Travelers in Paradise show. I think it was very well produced, although, you know, we're not experts in this by any means. And so... It was the best we could do at the time. We invested a lot of time and money in camera equipment and, and microphones and, and uh, uh, putting uh, my ex-wife Penny, putting her through the training so she could learn to do the editing. Uh, we, we edited it in Adobe Premiere Pro. And um, in any event, so we ended up putting together this show called Travelers in Paradise. And so what I'd, I'd like to do is I'm going to go through the show. It's a long show. It's, a, it's a 23, 24 minutes, something like that. And uh, I'm going to narrate a little bit and uh, break it down for you. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to be brutally honest about the mistakes that we made along the way, things we could have done better and done different. Uh, but you'll see that I, you know, overall, I think we had a pretty good product. And uh, I think I can do a lot better now with, uh, you know, an extra dozen years of experience behind me and uh, having had a few hiccups, if you go back through the videos on this channel, uh, even though this is now Grandpa Reacts channel, my old content is on here. You can see where I, by myself, went out on a boat and scuba dived. And, uh, well, I didn't do any scuba diving in that particular one, but, but uh, a lot of sailing and travel. So uh, we're, we're going to bring a lot of the scuba diving back into the mix. But anyway, let's go ahead and watch this. Uh, this was filmed in the British Virgin Islands. Uh, we chartered a, a catamaran uh, for this particular episode, and, uh, well, you'll see. You'll see. Let's go ahead and jump into it. Productions, baby. Hit it. In this episode of Travelers in Paradise, we look for treasure on Norman Island, 
We learn the difference between Buccaneers and barbecue, and we get a tour of Kelly's Cove by a local. Okay, before I go any further, just to give you guys an idea where we're at, this is at the Pirate's Bite on on uh, Norman Island in the British Virgin Islands. Um, this That's the Pirate's Bite bar restaurant there, or at least as it was 10 years ago. Storm came through, did a lot of damage, they rebuilt a lot. So a lot of that has changed. But nonetheless, there's still a beach bar on the beach on, on Norman Island right there at the Bite. Uh, you will also find at the Bite um, a very well-known uh, ship sitting there in the harbor uh, where people go out and do a lot of drinking and, and debauchery and, uh, you know, they'll get drunk and jump off the back of the ship. And, and that's the, uh, uh, oh, hell, now I'm blocking. I can't remember the name of the ship. Oh, well, I'll remember as we go through here. So, anyhow, let's go ahead and see Pirates Bite. By the way, you may recognize that music. That was Jelena doing Rusty Waste. We just did a review on her. So, you can listen to that review if you want to go back a couple episodes. The Willie T, that's the name of the boat. The Willie T is the floating bar. Now, we tried to do this to become like a TV show. So we have a couple of different episodes of different things that we're doing. Hi, I'm Carl. Hi. Look at them apples, huh? I'm Penny. <laughs> I guess a yellow feather is good for catching a barracuda, and that's it. The ex-wife. <laughs> and I'm like, knowing how isn't my job. I just drive the boat. And the daughter. We're just three very ordinary people on an extraordinary adventure. Come join our family as we travel the world by sailboat exploring exotic locations and become one of the travelers in paradise. Can you handle it? Can you handle it? Can you handle it? Can you handle it? In August of 1750, a Spanish galleon loaded with treasure, rumored to be 55 chests of silver among other valuables, is seeking shelter from a storm off the North Carolina coast. In that time, her crew mutinies and takes the treasure and loads it onto two smaller vessels. The first vessel is lost at sea, but the captain of the second takes it to Norman Island where he buries the treasure. The captain and crew were later arrested on an island in the Netherland Antilles, but not before word of the treasure got out. Gilbert Fleming, lieutenant general of the Leeward Islands, and a group of residents from Portola found and dug up the treasure on Norman Island. They later convinced the Lieutenant General of the BVI to give him and those who had found it a third of the treasure as a reward. There is a rumor that a local fisherman fishing near Norman Island was caught in a storm and sought shelter from the storm in one of the caves. That night, the storm surge raised the water level in the cave several feet and his boat was repeatedly smashed against the wall of the caves. The next morning, he discovered that a lot of rubble had fallen into his boat, including a chest laden with gold. To this day, there is still a rumor that there is still more treasure on Norman Island just waiting to be found. Conveniently located right around the corner from Pirate's Bite is the world famous snorkeling site, The Cave. As you can see from all the mooring balls out front, this is a national park. Now to give you some perspective, let me, let me just back up here a little bit. Not quite that far. Ah. All right, there. So, so this is the bite of Norman Island. So, so if you go in that, if you go in that area there, you go in there. <laughs> uh, that's where you'll find the Willie T uh, floating bar and restaurant, and also the Pirates Bite Bar. This is all that, and this is all the same island. It's a, it's a U shape here. Uh, this is all Norman Island, and the caves are found right here on the outside of this area here. Right around the corner from Pirates Bite is the world famous snorkeling site, the Caves. As you can see from all the mooring balls out front, this is a national park site. So we're going to pull up on our chartered sailboat, Sea of Love, and grab one of the mooring balls closest to the caves for an easy snorkel in. I'm now going to demonstrate for you guys my favorite way to pick up a mooring ball. Let me pause this here for a second. So the, the national park maintains these mooring balls. There's also a mooring ball field inside the bite there that's operated by Pirate's Bite. Um, these mooring balls are uh, to replace anchors. They don't want visiting boats to come in and drop and pick up anchors every time we go in there because the anchors will tear up the coral reef and destroy the bottom. 
So if you're going to be in a place like like the Bight or here at the Indians, they set these permanently mounted mooring balls, which have a very big heavy anchor, usually a big concrete block or something on the bottom, a uh, heavy tackle going up, a float, and then a tag. This is what uh, Lacey's grabbing here. She's grabbing the tag end. That's what you tie your boat off to. And uh, it protects the, 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 the bottom, the reefs in the bottom, it protects them from all the anchors and, and that kind of activity uh, and chains dragging and that sort of thing. I'll get into anchoring techniques later on, but uh, so the trick is, is that somebody's running the boat and when you're running the boat, you really can't see where that tag is because you're, you're kind of over the top of it. And so Lacey's demonstrating here how she learned to, uh, how I taught her, how she learned to uh, grab the tag end and, and tie off the bow. Okay, that's how you pick it up, but she didn't actually tie the boat off to it. She just brought it up and then hooked it right onto the cleat there. It's a tropical place where there's no one around. There's a water Even though it's possible to just swim into the caves, we recommend that you take a map, snorkel, and fins, and a waterproof light. The caves are quite large and have lots of nooks and crannies to explore. The first cave here is really cool. There's some bats way back up in the crevices, and without your dive light, they'll be hard to see. As you swim out, don't forget to keep your eyes open, as there's lots of interesting things to see, like these glassy sweepers. Surprising how many fish there were inside the cave in the dark. These glassy sleepers seem to like it that way. And as we're exiting this particular cave, we swam into a big bait ball of little minnows. Even though there isn't a lot of coral, and this isn't known as a prime snorkeling site, it's important to keep an eye out on the bottom because you never know what you're going to see. As we were snorkeling out, we saw this awesome southern stingray that was rooting through the bottom, hunting for mussels and clams. One of the impressive things about the caves as you're snorkeling from cave to cave is the massive boulders that are on the bottom. And if you just keep your eyes open and keep looking, you're gonna see all sorts of interesting fish. As you enter the last cave, it really doesn't look like much from the outside. It looks kind of small, but the last cave is one of the largest and one of the more interesting ones. There's all sorts of nooks and crannies in this cave. But as you turn around, that's where the real treat of the cave is. There's a second opening out onto this little beach. I think it's really cool how all the tree roots and bush roots are hanging down here on the outside. You know, these trees and bushes have no dirt at all to grow on as they just hang their roots over the rock and that provides them with all the nutrients they need to survive. Really a cool cave and, and I like the second entrance out onto the beach. Stay tuned, we're gonna meet up with Thomas from Pirate's Bite and learn about buccaneers and barbecue. Travelers in Paradise is brought to you by Equinox, because the only thing that should get wet is you. Sea of Love, Captain BVI Yacht Charter. Stay tuned. Travelers in Paradise will be right back. Okay, so that was like a typical commercial. We did that ourselves. Um, that's the dive housing that we had for our uh, uh, our high-end Panasonic video camera that we used. Um, so the Pirate's Bite is just one of the very many places that you can go to uh, in the British Virgin Islands. It's, it's probably one of the most notable um, and, and it's a typical first stop for a lot of people that, that are bouncing around in the BVI. It's directly across uh, from Tortola um, and, and Nanny Key Marina, which is the main uh, marina that we used that trip. 
uh, on Tortola, which is on the, in the British Virgin Islands as opposed to the U.S. or Spanish Virgin Islands. Um, so we stayed on the charter catamaran. It came with a skipper, the guy that actually owned the boat. And uh, then we, uh, we snorkeled and we went around and, and seen all these various sites. You could see that Lacey was narrating kind of uh, what we saw on the bottom and tried to explain a little bit of that. And we go into that in more detail later on, on different places that we dive. And uh, the format of our show was broken up, typical television. So, you know, seven, six, five, and three are the how many minutes each section is in a normal television show. Um, and so we had to kind of follow that same format and break it up so that they had the right time to put in their commercials uh, that the network was selling to people as opposed to the dive housing and that kind of stuff commercials you can see that we've done ourselves so anyhow let's go on welcome back to travelers in paradise pirate's bite is one of the most beautiful beach bars and restaurants in the caribbean and it's nestled here at the point of the bite on norman island when we're sailing in the british virgin islands my favorite first stop is the pirate's bite on norman island this is a great little beach bar and restaurant that really maintains the pirate history Five o'clock every night, they have a cannon firing, signaling happy hour. They also have a nice little museum showing some of the- she, she about took a toe off there, but yes, every evening when, when it's happy hour time, they fire off a, a little cannon like that. Of the pirate artifacts that were found on the island. Thomas is going to tell us all about how they keep the pirate spirit alive by still cooking their barbecue in the same traditional fashion. Barbecue here is a, it's very popular. Thomas, by the way, is the manager here at Nanny, at Nanny Key. Uh, no, I'm sorry, not Nanny Key. At Norman Island. He's the manager for the Pirate's Bite in Norman Island. The style of cooking in the British Virgin Islands. And there's a couple of different reasons why. One is that it's, it's pretty easy to do on a beach. Um, it's a very uh, people-friendly approach to food because you get around an open fire on the beach and cook some food and have some drinks and, and have a good time. But um, historically, um, it's based on a uh, French style of cooking that's related to um, uh, piracy and how the name for pirates came about. Um, and uh, there's a style of cooking uh, in uh, the French culinary practice, which is called boucanier, which is to you take a big uh, joint of meat, usually beef, and um, you roll it in herbs and spices, and then you cover it down in um, sugar and rum, and you roast that over an open fire, which when you think about it, herbs, spices, sugar, and rum, that is barbecue sauce. And, um, and so... Uh, the How many of you people have rum in your barbecue sauce? I'd be interested. Tell us in the comments down below, how many of you guys actually put rum in your barbecue sauce? And further, how many of you are gonna use rum in your barbecue sauce the next time you make it? Uh, pirates that lived in this area preferred that style of um, uh, cooking their food. Uh, in fact, the place that they would stop off to get their beef is Beef Island, where our um, airport is located. And um, they would stop off and steal a cow, cut it up, roll it in spices and sugar and roast it up on a beach. And so the French referred, referred to their pirates as, uh, according to the style of food, which is uh, boucanier. And so the French term for a pirate is a buccaneer. Um, and that's entered the English uh, lexicon for pirates. That's how barbecue came to be in the British Virgin Islands. So what we do actually... So, so did you get that? A buccaneer is just a pirate who likes to barbecue out on the beach. That's basically what a buccaneer is. I find that kind of interesting. I don't know if it's true, but it certainly is interesting. Is, uh, we go around in our little van like I just carried you guys in, and we collect um, wild wood off the hillsides. We look for driftwood on the beaches. We bring it down behind the restaurant. Uh, we start up a fire and uh, we make a, uh, I guess you could call it kind of like a basting liquid. Herbs and spices, we put some rum in the water and uh, we uh, poach off uh, the ribs in that. Okay, and then uh, take them out and uh, grill them over an open fire, soak them down in our own uh, signature barbecue sauce, and uh, it's uh, easily our most popular dish on the menu. A Taste of the Caribbean brought to you by Sunny Caribbean Spices. Hi folks, Carl here with Travelers in Paradise doing our very first cooking episode. This okay guys, look at how long ago that is. Look at how, oh man, 
I've gotten old in the last 10 years. This is really cool. So when we were down in the British Virgin Islands, we found a company called Sunny Caribbean, and they make these spice blends. They take super fresh spices from the Caribbean, they add to that sea salt that's harvested there in the British Virgin Islands, and they mix it together and they make these wonderful spice blends. Now the sea salt down there is really special. They make it the old fashioned way. They have salt ponds where they flood the salt ponds full of water, they let the sun do its job and bake all the water off so all you're left with is the salt, then they go in and harvest it and they use that salt to make their blends. Now today we're gonna to be doing a couple things on the grill, bringing a little bit of that, that pirate history, that barbecue pirate history into uh, your own home kitchen. So I'm gonna show you how to use some of these Caribbean spices today. Okay, before we go on, you might notice that we're not in the Caribbean anymore. <laughs> um, we owned uh, 20 acres uh, overlooking the Yellowstone River. If you see there in the background, um, right at about that level, there, top my finger, where those trees are, uh, that's actually the Yellowstone River. And if you watch carefully, you'll see cars go by. That's 89 South. That's the main road that runs from Gardner, Montana, which is there at the north end of Yellowstone National Park, up to Livingston, Montana. And where most recently they, they have that base, that new TV show called Yellowstone, um, that's Paradise Valley, that's the Yellowstone River. This is the area that that's supposedly based in, although it's not in Paradise Valley. They do film a lot, though, in Livingston and, and, Mon and Bozeman, so that's pretty cool. In any event, so this goofball, <laughs> me, is going to now uh, do a little cooking episode for you. One of the things we're doing, Brussels sprouts. We're going to take the Sunny Caribbean seasoned sea salt, and we're going to do Brussels sprouts on the grill. So let me get started. First thing you want to do, and I've got a bunch of them prepped already, take your Brussels sprout, remove the end, kind of peel off some of the some of the leaves, some of the off the edge, and then simply just put it in half, that simple, into the bowl. See, I've got these all set and ready to go. Now what we're going to do is we're going to add a little bit of EVOO, just a little bit in there, and then we're going to simply toss them. Just that simple. You want to toss them all so you get a good coating on them. Then we go with the Sunny Caribbean seasoned sea salt, and we give a little seasoning to all of them. Simply go ahead, give it a good toss, and that's it. She's ready to go on the grill, and these are just awesome, folks. When you cook them on the grill, the Brussels sprouts really sweeten up. The sugars come out in them. They make just an awesome side dish. And now we're going to do chicken. Nothing says the Caribbean like jerk spice. So we're just going to give the chicken a real light coating of the jerk spice before we put them on the grill. Well, hey, Paku, how are you today? Paku is our dog. That's who you probably heard barking just a little bit ago. She's chasing off all the woolly boogers out there in the woods, making sure nothing, nobody comes and attacks us. Right now, I think she wants to get up here and eat our chicken. So I give it a good liberal coating on one side, and then I want to turn it over so we make sure we get the bottom side of everything. A jerk is just a classic Caribbean spice it is a blend of spices that can be found all over the Caribbean and uh, best known, I guess, really for Jamaica, but uh, it makes for just a wonderful blend and it is awesome on chicken. Okay, now we'll let those sit for uh, an hour or so in the chill chest and those will be ready to go on the grill. Stay tuned as Carl pays homage to the Boucanier style of cooking. Wobbin the decks. Travelers in Paradise will be right back. The cast and crew at Travelers in Paradise would like to invite you to join us on our next adventure. Sign up for our next on the set scuba diving vacation. Become part of the crew as we tape episodes for Travelers in Paradise. This unique vacation experience allows you to get a behind the scenes look at what a real television production is all about. Join in our dives, tours, and travels as one of our crew or just tag along for the fun. Check out our website and join us for our next on the set scuba diving vacation. Welcome back to Travelers in Paradise. Carl's got the grill all ready to go. Now, obviously that had been recorded earlier, so don't try calling the website. It won't work. Just ready for the Brussels sprouts so I can put them in the grill. This is a little rack. You can probably buy them at most of your mega marts or whatever. And I just like to use a little spray, a little non-stick on it and uh, get it lubed up. Now start that in there so uh, it can start getting warm. Now we're going to go ahead and get the uh, chicken on the grill first. So let's go ahead and get that started. Now the thighs uh, are just about as meaty as the breast, so they should 
cook at about the same amount of time. But what you really need to do with charcoal is you really gotta watch your drill because there'll be hot spots and there'll be cold spots. And if you know your drill, you'll know where to place your food to work kind of around that. That jerk spice is just, mm, I mean, it's, you know, it just, it really brings me right back down to the Caribbean. I mean, there we are sitting there on the beach listening to them cook the, the ribs or something that we did down there in the Caribbean. It really brings that home. So here you are at home. I mean, I'm back here in Montana. You can see the mountains in the background. We're cooking here in the backyard in Montana. And I'm going to have the same meal that I would have had down there in the Caribbean, thanks to Sunny Caribbean, their fresh spices. So that's getting good and hot. Let me close that down, put a little heat to it. Okay, well, we got the grill up to 350 now. So let's just take a quick sneak peek. All right. All right, no flamage, which is what I wanted. But you notice all that smoke? You know, it took me years to get this grill. I know it looks like an old rusty grill, but it took me years to get this grill where it's really seasoned perfectly, where we really get just some wonderful flavor out of it. And that's been a combination of years of different types of cooking in there. Chicken and ribs and steaks and lobsters and shrimp and all kinds of stuff that we've cooked over the years, different seasonings and barbecue sauces and what have you. But the combination of all that and good quality charcoal you know, we've used hickory and we've used mesquite and applewood and all kinds of charcoals in there. And we've really got this nice. If you like the charcoal, always use uh, a, a chimney to get your charcoal started. Do not ever, ever, and I mean ever, use that Max Light stuff. It'll make all your food taste like starting liquid. Seasoned grill now. Well, this is the one thing that was kind of unique. When we were down in the British Virgin Islands, uh, and I think you'll see in a couple of our episodes, you know, we, we showed uh, Clarence down at uh, CNF doing his ribs and then the, uh, the Pirate's Bite, we did some ribs over Pirate, Pirate, Pirate's Bite and we showed that. The one thing we cannot duplicate here in the country and in the United States is we can't duplicate the charcoal, the wood that they use and that or the seasoning in their grill and that imparts a flavor we simply can't duplicate. But fortunately with Sunny Caribbean Spices, we can at least have the right seasonings on our meat and make it as close to it as possible. By the way, I still recommend Sunny Caribbean Spices. You can uh, get online and order uh, online from them. They're down in Tortola and they will ship to you. Okay, we're just about ready to turn that chicken. Let me grab my tongs. Now what I'm gonna do to turn the chicken is I am gonna open this up a little bit because otherwise there'll be so much smoke you won't even be able to see where the chicken is. There we go. Oh yeah, just perfect. Look at that on the grill. That jerk seasoning, that jerk seasoning gives it a flavor. You just cannot believe, folks. It is just an absolute wonderful flavor. You know, it, it reminds me of Jamaica in the West Indies there. Uh, it has a, a very unique flavor to it. Oh man, that jerk seasoning is so awesome. And you see the, the pan for my Brussels sprouts is, uh, is just perfectly hot now, so I'm going to go ahead and add the Brussels sprouts to the grill. See that, you know, that, that kind of caramelization that they get. It's just what you're looking for. It really brings out the sweetness in those Brussels sprouts. We'll just see how well the, uh, the chicken is done. Oh, perfect. Frankly, I think our cooking episodes are way too long. Brussels sprouts off the grill, pull it up I'm so I don't burn my Question hand. if it's even necessary. Oh, what do you guys man, think? Is it good to have a cooking perfect. episode in there? And we'll get some of these beautiful Brussels sprouts cooked with that. I will tell you that was delicious chicken and Brussels sprouts. I can remember that right now. Well, here we go. A little bit of that jerk seasoning on. I'm telling you folks, this is awesome. Don't ever trust a skinny chef, because this is the way barbecue was meant to be. Do this True. yourself. Get our spice blends from Sunny Caribbean. You can order them on our website, at travelsinparadise.com. No, you, you can can't. make steaks, you can make pork, you can make lobster, shrimp, obviously some chicken. Get some of our spices, have yourself a Caribbean evening. Thanks, folks. Next, we get a guided tour of Kelly's Cove from a Norman Island local. Travelers in Paradise will be right back. 
Whether you are a novice or advanced diver, Blue Water Divers has been teaching people to scuba dive and leading dive trips in the British Virgin Islands for over 30 years. Some of the top dive spots in the BVI are the world famous wreck of the mail ship Rome, the Indians with their amazing rock formations, and the colorful rainbow caverns just off of Pelican Island. All of these are just a quick boat ride away from our two convenient locations. Contact Blue Water Divers today and plan your next scuba vacation. Do you like to vacation at waterfront resorts? Do you like to swim? Want to look out at the water and see all the pretty sailboats? Well, stop looking and start doing. On Sea of Love, you are the view. Let this gorgeous sailing catamaran be the place you stay on your next vacation. Jump right off the decks and into pristine, crystal clear, 82 degree water chock full of pretty fishes and places to explore. Make Sea of Love your next vacation choice. It's almost a little Welcome embarrassing back watching to Travelers this. In Paradise. Kelly's Cove isn't a regular commercial dive site. When we first dropped in, the first thing we noticed was the massive sponges and other filter feeders. That's me in the background there. I don't know if you can see it, but right there to the left of that As sponge, we there was a... we noticed that there was these beautiful black and yellow rock beauties. And in this episode, they've served as our tour guides to show us all the cool things there are to see. So if we just pay attention to them, they're going to show us all of the really neat things. And yeah, there was an endangered species fish that should have been killed and taken out of there. Rock beauties are found only in the tropical Western Atlantic Ocean. They are the smallest member of the angelfish family and very distinctive with their black bodies and bright yellow head and tail. Beautiful. Both adults and juveniles are highly territorial. Juveniles are almost completely yellow with a small black dot below the dorsal fin which grows bigger as they get older. They feed mainly on sponges but are also known to eat tunicates and algae. By following our tour guide, Rocky, we found this really awesome underwater palm tree looking sponge. We think it's an encrusting sponge on a Gorgonian skeleton. A truly fascinating specimen. What do you think? If you know what it is, contact us at travelersinparadise.com. I want to point out to you guys the amount of life there is here. Compare this to the amount of life we saw over at the caves, which is just about a half a mile to the west of here. They're the same ocean and very close to each other. You would think that they would be identical, but they're not. Rocky, our tour guide, says that it's time to move along, but we can't follow him into his hole here. So we looked up above his home and we saw this river of brown and blue chromis. Here's another coral similar to the palm tree, but not nearly as impressive. This river of brown and blue chromis just kept going on and on and on. So we decided to follow it and see what we could find. Uh, you probably noticed me smiling there. I'm sorry, but I can't help but be proud of, of Lacey. She, she grew up to be um, a pretty good kid. I miss her, haven't seen her in a long time, but. So proud of her. As we follow the river of Chromos. Okay, hold on. Now I'm filming. I've taken the camera from Lacey because I saw this turtle swimming off in the distance. And so I grabbed the camera and I went over after this turtle. And it was really cool because the turtle just sort of stayed with me. It wasn't the least bit afraid. It just sort of hung out with me for a while. And uh, me and the turtle had a long swim together. Over the hill, we have a special encounter with a favorite reef inhabitant, the Hawksbill Turtle. I have one of the coolest special encounters with him as we swim alongside as dive buddies. Sadly, the Hawksbill Turtle are critically endangered. They have very long lives, take 30 years to sexually mature, and have slow reproductive rates. Previously, these turtles were harvested for their meat and <coughs> shells. The meat is considered a delicacy and their shells have been used as decorations in many different cultures. Heavy hunting of the hawksbill turtle has led to a sharp decline in the numbers of these turtles worldwide. Quite often the turtle shells were used to make combs for ladies. 
and cast an uncertainty over their future. They were declared endangered in 1982 and upgraded to critically endangered in 1996. Hawksbill turtles are solitary and only meet up to mate. Females typically lay 140 eggs. These eggs hatch at night, with the hatchlings making their way back to the ocean, drawn to it by the reflection of the moon on the water. Hatchlings are in danger of being confused by light sources such as street lamps, thus inhibiting them from making it to the ocean. Those that do not make it back into the water by daybreak will be eaten by predators. Here in the Virgin Islands, nests are also raided by marauding mongooses and other predators. What an honor and pleasure it was just to be able to swim alongside with him in the reef. How cool to be able to share this dive with such a beautiful turtle. All right. Well, that pretty much wraps up the episode. So there's me swimming away with a turtle. Something I got to get back to. Got to get back to as soon as I possibly can. I got to get back to that. And, um, and the nice thing about it is I'll be able to continue to do my music reviews no matter where I am in the world once I'm on board my boat. And yeah, this is from uh, Norman's, uh, uh, from Norman Island, from the bite looking out, the sunset behind the sailboats. Just beautiful, 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 beautiful place. And yeah, that's it. So that was one of our episodes. Like I said, there's four of them, I believe, right now that you can see on, uh, on YouTube and um, covering different aspects of some of the things that we saw and did while we were in the British Virgin Islands. Um, in a lot of ways, I still like what we did. I still like the product we put out. Some of it's kind of embarrassing to me at this point looking at it, but uh, geez, you know, well, you know, the camera equipment wasn't as good as what it is now. And I mean, it's 10 years ago. So, you know, we, we were shooting in 720p and thinking we were state of the art, you know, and now, of course, we're in 4 and 5K. So it makes, uh, it makes a huge difference. And of course, you know, a continuous ongoing onslaught of investing in better and better and better cameras so uh, that's the nature of that beast but in any event that's an episode of travelers in paradise that is kind of kind of what i want to get back to doing as a uh, as a youtuber uh, and i will do be doing that not on this channel not on grandpa reacts but on my uh, grandpa's retirement plan youtube channel uh and um uh, I'd like to expand on that. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to be able to continue to raise some awareness of things, talk about some of the ecological aspects of it, you know, sort of a modern day, but very small scale Jacques Cousteau kind of thing. Um, you know, me on my boat traveling around the world, scuba diving and, and visiting all the different places. Um, I'd like to do less of the land excursion kind of stuff. Um, I'd like to do less of the cooking episode kind of thing, but you know, when we did this show, that was sort of like almost expected, you know, every TV show that was, uh, putting out an episode back then had a cooking episode. The, the cooking network was a big thing on the cable TV. And so it was sort of a fad right then. And, and glad we're getting kind of away from that, but, uh, and now with YouTube where we get to do short format rather than try to do a half hour show like this, you know, I could just do five and 10 minute segments on different things that I find interesting or, or worthy of copying. So um, anyhow, that's kind of the nature of it. Uh, uh, I am proud of the work that we did. I'm embarrassed to some degree by the work that we did. I think some of our stuff was pretty amateurish. Some of it was spot on and just as good as anything people are still putting out. So uh, it, it's a it's a growing thing, and you know, you with time you get better and better and better at it. That was actually our second episode that we did for Travelers in Paradise, so we were very much in a learning curve at that point, especially since we had to um, we had to learn and perfect all of the things that were expected of us being on network television. You know, um, you know, you saw those little those little bars that came across with names and stuff on it what they call a lower third, um, you know, those sorts of, of, of technical things had to be done. Uh, and so Penny had to learn a lot of that kind of fanciness that, uh, you know, frankly, we just don't really do that much of anymore. So uh, it's become more loosey-goosey now on YouTube. You can get away with a lot less stuff, and, and it comes off maybe a bit more genuine 
maybe a little less professional, but a little bit more down home earthiness to it, you know, if you, if you get what I mean. Anyhow, if you like seeing more of this sort of review, I'd be very interested to see your comments. I have three other episodes I could review if you want to, or I could go on to, you know, do reviews of other things. Uh, but, you know, somebody requested that I do this. I think they wanted to get an idea about me and uh, a little bit more of our background and history. And um, like I said, I've had this dream to be on a sailboat and sail around the world. I've actually had that dream since I was about 10 years old. I used to live in a place called Port Washington, New York, ride my bike down to the town dock with my fishing rod and, and sit out there and fish for flounder. And... Uh, Look at all those pretty sailboats out in the harbor. Now here about four years ago, I had the ability of buying a small boat up on uh, Lake Erie on Sandusky, Ohio. And it was a 40 some year old uh, Cal 30 sailboat that had been sitting on the hard for 10 years and had had a lot of rod on it and, and, and was pretty rough. Uh, I bought it for $2,800. Uh, wasn't going to buy it. The boat had more work necessary to it than I was really wanting to do. I did not want a project boat or something that was going to take that much work. Um, and, and as I'm walking all around the boat, you know, we got on it and looked inside and seen all the wood rot and stuff that needed to be fixed and walked around the outside. And, and, uh, I'm telling the guy, eh, you know, I, I think this is just going to be too much work, too much work. And then I walked around and looked at the, the back of the boat, the stern, and on the stern is where they put the boat's name, right? So I walked around the back of the boat, and there on the back of the boat, I looked up. Damn. Now I have to buy the boat. Just that simple. Uh, it was God telling me this is what I needed to do. It was God giving me a sign, quite literally giving me a sign. The name sign on the back of the boat was the Lily 2. That was the name of the boat, the Lily 2. Well, guess what my dog's name is? Miss Lily. So, like I said, it was God's way of saying, hey, you and this boat need to do this. And sure enough, uh, she held together. She, she did the job that I needed done. Uh, we bought that boat, like I said, for $2,800. I put, you know, maybe another couple grand into it, making it functional and fixing up some of the damage that had been done certainly was not pretty i mean we're talking plastic bucket and a plywood box to, for a for a head i mean no shower no running water nothing like that um no air conditioning just uh you know plain boat and uh anyhow me and me and the dog we took that boat uh from sandusky ohio across lake erie into the erie canal the full length of the erie canal out to the hudson river um, now, when we got to Buffalo, New York, on the far side of the Erie Canal, we had to take down the mast. We had to, to drop the mast because on the Erie Canal, there's low bridges. So you got to take your mast down. When we got over to the Hudson River, we put the mast back up and um, then re rigged it so we could sail again. Anyhow, so then we took the boat from there down the Hudson River around Manhattan into Long Island Sound over to Manhasset Bay, which is at the harbor there at Port Washington, New York, where I grew up as a kid, so my home waters. Then right there was the town dock I used to sit on and go fish. So it was really kind of a, a really cool moment for me to sail into Manhasset Bay on my own pretty sailboat. Well, quasi-pretty. In any event, so I spent uh, the summer there uh, on the boat, hanging out, talking to friends and stuff. <coughs> oh, excuse me. And, uh, oh, I got a good beverage. Bear with me here a second. Get in there, dog. I just got to swing over here to my fridge. I know, very unprofessional of me. And I'm back. <laughs> Sorry about that. Something in my throat. <coughs> and there's, there's the dog talking about her. Anyhow, uh, so we came out of Manhasset Bay after being there for two months. Went out Long Island Sound to Rhode Island, met a friend of mine there, turned around, went back to Manhattan, anchored overnight right behind Statue of Liberty. That was pretty cool. So I got to go to bed that night looking at, you know, New York skyline, but I mean, right up, you know, from the water's edge. So I was pretty close. 
And uh, next morning, we took it off from there, went off the coast of New Jersey, uh, up the Delaware, uh, Delaware Bay, down the Chesapeake Bay, uh, to Norfolk, Virginia, where we put into the Intercoastal Waterway, followed that all the way down the coastline till we got to uh, the Florida Keys, and we took the boat all the way to Marathon, Florida. Uh, just, just me and this dog. And uh, it took us in all about seven months to make that trip. That was a, a phenomenal experience for me. And uh, it motivated me to want to get back out there and do this, but, but with a better boat, with a, with a better boat. So, so right now, what I am diligently working towards is uh, acquiring that better boat. Um, and, uh, and then we're going to head off again. But this time... I want to go all the way up into uh, Canada and hit the Trent Severn Waterway and then get over by Chicago and go down the rivers to go back out to the uh, Gulf of Mexico and then back over to Florida. And then from there, spend the winter in the Bahamas, then make my way down the Windwards and Lourdes and head over to Panama through the canal and up to Sea of Cortez in Mexico and then over to Hivo and French Polynesia and just, you know, I want to keep heading west, keep sailing off into the sunset as long as I've got sunsets to sail off into. And uh, in regards to this channel, with doing these music reviews, uh, we have a system for the boat now uh, called Startlink. Thank you, uh, Elon, for creating that. And so no matter where I am, out in the middle of the ocean, 1,000 miles offshore, and I've got high-speed internet. Uh, so I'll be able to continue to do music reviews and, and just like I am now. It'll make no difference except it'll be, you know, a boat creaking behind me and, and beautiful sunsets and, and tropical, warm tropical waters. And I'll probably get a bit more tan and, well, probably a lot more gray. But it is what it is, kids. So that's the plan, Stan. That's what we want to do. I'd really be interested to hear your comments about all this. I can't believe you bared with me through this long of a video. I think we're going on like 47 minutes at this point. Uh, if you like long form stuff like this, let me know. I'll be happy to do it. In the meantime, kids, be good, be careful. Take good care of one another. Again, give us thumbs up, like, subscribe, ring the bell. We'll try to bring you more and, well, you know, better stuff. So thanks, kids.